institution is also an allowable use of funds. All of this information is available in the solicitation, which is on our website at www.bja.gov backslash capital F U-N-D-I-N-G backslash 13 J-M-H-C-P S-O-L dot P-D-F. Um, and that's um, up on the screen right now. Um, and to keep on moving through. So I'm going to start by going through the solicitation now and talking a little bit about um, what you can expect. Um, again, all of the information that I'm going to be covering is spelled out in the solicitation itself, and nothing that's in these slides here, um, although it may be slightly restated, nothing in these slides um, is is outside of the realm of the solicitation. It's all in here. All this information um, can be found at that website. So in starting with eligibility, um, those who can apply for this grant program are limited to states, units of local government, federally recognized Indian tribes, and tribal organizations. Each applicant must demonstrate that the proposed project will be administered jointly by a criminal or juvenile justice agency and a mental health agency. Only one agency is responsible for the submission of the application and grants that go. The, the lead agency must be the state, unit of local government, federally recognized Indian tribe, or tribal organization. And just to provide an, uh, some additional clarification on what that means, um, we get a lot of questions around this issue. Um, there must be, as stated, a criminal justice or juvenile justice agency and a mental health agency working in collaboration. But the criminal justice agency or the, or the mental health agency does not necessarily have to be the applicant. It can be a separate state agency altogether that applies on behalf of those two partners. But it can be one of the partners if one of those partners is an eligible entity um, as a state unit of local government, federally recognized Indian tribe or tribal organization. So the collaboration partners uh, may determine between them if one of them wants to be the primary organization applying, um, but that does, does not have to be. Hopefully that, that provides um, a, a little more clarification. Moving on, um, a criminal or juvenile justice agency is defined as an agency of state or local government that is responsible for detection, arrest, enforcement, prosecution, defense, adjudication, incarceration, probation, or parole relating to the violation of the criminal laws of that state or local government. A mental health agency is an agency of state or local government or its contracted agency that is responsible for mental health services or co-occurring mental health and substance abuse services. Next, moving on to target population. Grant funds must be used to support a target population that includes an adult or juvenile accused of a nonviolent offense who has been diagnosed as having a mental illness or co-occurring mental health and substance abuse disorder or has faced, is facing, or could face criminal charges for a misdemeanor or nonviolent offense. Per myocra, a nonviolent offense is an offense that does not have as an element the use, attempted use, or threatened use of physical force against the person or property of another or is not a felony that by its nature involves a substantial risk that physical force against the person or property of another may be used in the course of committing the offense. I'd also like to clarify that past criminal histories, including past convictions for violent crimes, are ir irrelevant for eligib eligibility purposes for this grant program. So in looking at your target population of who is eligible to participate in these programs, past history is not relevant. It's the current offense that um, is determining eligibility that must be the nonviolent offense. In looking at the different grant, ca grant categories, category one, planning. The maximum funding available is $50,000 and the project period must be 12 months. Category one applicants will design a strategic, collaborative plan to initiate systemic, 
change for the identification and treatment of system-involved individuals with mental illness or co-occurring substance abuse disorders. Category 2, planning and implementation, up to $250,000 is available for a period of 24 months. Category 2 applicants will complete an already initiated strategic plan for the Criminal Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program and begin implementation of the plan during the project period. Category 3, expansion, $200,000 is available for a period of 24 months. Category 3 applicants will expand upon or improve a well-established collaboration plan. Applicants must clearly demonstrate an expansion to the current functioning of an existing program. In looking at the performance measures, these are listed on page 12 to 16 of the solicitation. For those of you who may be past applicants, these have been updated in um, the past year or so, so you might want to take a close look, even if you have been a past applicant or past grantee. Um, all of the applications must demonstrate in their proposal the ability through a formal process to collect information related to the performance measures. Upon selection of the grantees, DJA will review the measures to provide guidance on which measures apply to your program. In reviewing the solicitation, there are several attachments which must be um, attached to your application when you submit into grants.gov. Specifically, those are program abstract, program narrative, budget and budget narrative, and if applicable, tribal authorizing legislation. A project timeline and MOU and letters of support are also um, necessary to attach, um, as well as an additional attachment I'll mention at the end. <laughs> it's most helpful, this is stated in the solicitation, but I just want to reiterate that it's most helpful when you are attaching these um, attachments to put in the title um, of your attachment which attachment it is. So saying, you know, pro program abstract in the title of the document um, is greatly appreciated. The program narrative. The program narrative must respond to selection criteria 1 through 5 listed on page 21 through 24 of the solicitation. Importantly, the application must be double-spaced, standard 12-point font with 1-inch margins. The page limit for the narrative is 15 pages. Looking at the budget, applicants must submit a budget worksheet and a budget narrative in one file as attachment three. For all applicants, include funding to support up to four staff to attend a two-day grantee orientation meeting in Washington, D.C. For category two and three applicants, additional travel costs should be included to attend a BJA-sponsored national meeting. Category two and three applicants must set aside at least 5% of the budget in order to implement a data collection plan. The plan should be described in a program narrative under selection criteria four. For all applicants, include the amount and source of match funding in the budget. Federal funds are awarded under this program may not cover more than 80% of the total cost of the project being funded. The applicant must identify the source of the 20% non-federal portion of the total project cost and how match funds will be used. Match can be in kind or cash. Um, and there's some links for a sample budget worksheet and the OJP financial guide. Again, these links are also listed in the solicitation. But there are those resources for you to help you with any questions you have about your budget. Um, I might also state that you can combine the two. Um, you can either have them separate and combine them into one, or you can, you can merge both documents, putting your narrative embedded into your worksheet. That's a possibility as well, as long as you identify that it's both your narrative and your budget worksheet. Your, I'm sorry, your budget narrative and your budget worksheet. In looking at other attachments, um, the project timeline and task plan, um, this must include each project goal, objective activity, um, expected completion date, and person responsible. Memoranda of understanding and letters of support, um, if 
available, um, these would include co-applicants and collaborative partners. And um, this is a new one this year, the applicant discourse of, I'm sorry, disclosure of pending applications. So we're requiring that applicants disclose to us any pending applications for federally funded assistance for the same project being proposed under this solicitation and we'll cover the identical cost items outlined in the budget narrative and worksheet in the application under the solicitation. So if you are applying to any other uh, federal grant programs for the same activities as included in your um, application, you must disclose this to us in a separate attachment. So grants.gov, the application must be submitted through grants.gov. Um, you must register with grants.gov as soon as possible if you have not done so already, um, as sometimes the registration process can take some time. Every organization who applies also needs a DUNS number, and if you don't have one, you can call Dunn and Bradstreet at 866-705-5711 or apply online at www.dnb.com. Applicants should also be up to date on their CCR information as well as know their taxpayer ID, which is your EIN number. Applicants who don't have an EIN number should apply immediately. According to the IRS, when applying for an EIN over the phone or Internet, you will be given a temporary EIN, but your EIN may not become active for up to two weeks. If you have any questions about this, please call 1-800-829-829. 4933. And again, all these numbers and uh, websites are in the solicitation if you um, haven't been able to jot them down um, while I'm speaking. Um, Grants.gov has a help desk uh, customer service hotline available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, except federal holidays. Um, for any kind of technical difficulties you may have with the application process. That number is 800-518-4726 or 606-545-5035, although uh, we must caution that sometimes, um, oftentimes, um, applicants uh, wait until the last minute to submit their applications, and then there's difficulty reaching um, support at grants.gov because everybody is calling in at the same time when they're experiencing technical difficulties. So, again, we urge you, the earlier you can submit your applications, the better off we will all be. Um, and we also encourage you to um, sign up for grants.gov email notifications regarding the solicitation in case there is any cancellation or modification, um, you will be notified. So additional important information. As BJA is currently operating under a continuing resolution, no appropriation has yet been made for JMHCT. Even though we're issuing this solicitation now and encouraging um, app applicants uh, to apply, um, we do not currently have a budget, we don't know how much to expect, and we can't anticipate how many awards we're going to make at this time. The deadline for submission is 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on March 25th, 2013, and again, it strongly encourages that applicants submit the application well in advance of this deadline. Um, next is a slide with some resources for you. Um, again, the first uh, link is the, is the link to our solicitation, which I previously mentioned. Um, the next link is a specific um, path to get to um, more detailed information on JMHCT on our website. You can also just go to our website, which is uh, bja.gov, and follow the prompts to the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program. Um, next is the BJA Writing Manual, um, which is a resource out there for all of you who are looking to um, write your uh, proposals and need assistance with that. And then last is the Council of State Governments Justice Center, our training and technical assistance provider who is um, uh, 
administering this webinar today, but who you'll also hear from after I'm done speaking about some of the services that they provide on behalf of BJA for our Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program grantees. If you have um, any questions about any requirement of this solicitation, we encourage you to call the BJA Justice Information Center at 1-877-927-5600. Or you can send an email at capital J I C at T E L E S I S H Q dot com or via live web chat at www.justiceinformationcenter.us. The BJA Justice Information Center hours of operation are 8.30 a.m. through 5 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday, and 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the solicitation close date. Notice that even though the, the application deadline is 11.59 p.m. Um, into the grants.gov system, the Justice Information Center will only be open until 8 p.m. on that close date. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our partners at the Justice Center um, and my colleague, Jerry Murphy. Thanks, Annika. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jerry Murphy. I'm with the uh, Council of State Governments Justice Center, uh, Deputy Director of the National uh, Division. Um, and we are the uh, technical and Training, I'm sorry, Training and Technical Assistance Partner uh, for the Bureau of Justice Assistance for those applicants that do receive grantees uh, in this category and also in the area of reentry, uh, which is a, a separate uh, a grant opportunity. But we, as I said, we are available for those who already do receive grants. Um, we do not provide any assistance. Uh, to you as you prepare your proposal, but if you were to visit our website, you might find some resources there that uh, could inform you um, about what uh, other uh, grantees uh, are doing with their programs, and that might help you uh, get some, uh, possibly some ideas about how you want to structure your proposal. Um, we work with uh, the grantees, uh, and these are all across the country. Um, as you can see by the little map that we have up there, um, uh, the grantees are spread across the entire country. They come from urban, suburban, and rural jurisdictions. Um, the technical assistance uh, and training that we provide uh, is done primarily through our technical assistance coordinators. And these are full-time staff members at the Justice Center um, who work with uh, the grantees uh, to help you complete the requirements uh, that you've outlined in your proposal and which will be part of your grant award. And the technical assistance coordinator um, is assigned to your, uh, to your grant specifically and would work with you during the course, the lifetime of that grant. And the role is to support you uh, as you work through the grant, both by providing uh, on-site and off-site assistance. Uh, they will help identify resources and, uh, and expertise, uh, again, from across the country that, that might be helpful to you as you work through some of the challenges in planning or implementing your program. Uh, they can also link you to your peers, that is, other grantees that are working on uh, similar types of programs. Um, they can help you identify challenges uh, that you're encountering as you implement uh, your programs and help you work through those challenges by providing suggestions and resources uh, and other materials that, that you might find helpful. Uh, the on-site assistance uh, is conducted uh, by our technical assistance coordinators. Oftentimes, uh, they will visit your site in, in collaboration with consultants that we retain who might have some specific expertise um, for the program that you're working on or perhaps some specific challenges that you are encountering. Uh, we do not necessarily provide on-site assistance to all grantees. 
uh, but we try to visit as many as we can. Uh, if we're not doing on-site technical assistance um, with you, uh, we certainly work with you on an off-site capability uh, through phone calls and emails. Uh, we try to schedule phone calls um, at, at least monthly uh, with all of the grantees to sort of get a status check uh, to find out where you are in your process, again, what challenges you might be encountering, um, and to answer questions uh, or any help you might need in terms of finding other resources. So. Uh, some of those resources um, you can find on our website, um, and the address is there um, at uh, csgjusticecenter.org. Um, one of our most recent resources is a mental health court curriculum, uh, which is, that has just been released in the past month. Um, you might find that helpful to take a look at, but it's just a, a, an example of the types of resources that you can find on our website. Now, in addition to that, we also have a number of publications. Uh, these are publications that are authored and published by the Justice Center. Um, in addition, uh, you can find links to other important documents and publications uh, that could help inform you as you um, both work on your proposal and then if you're successful in getting an award uh, as you work through your grant. As David can mention, <coughs> um, you will need to uh, budget for a uh, grantee orientation uh, and or national training and technical assistance conference. Um, just by coincidence, uh, we are doing uh, both of those events uh, next week, um, but those are for current grantees. It is a one-day orientation for all new grantees, uh, which we do on an annual basis, and then every other year uh, we put on a one-and-a-half-day conference um, for all grantees. And as Barrett has mentioned, um, you are expected to send uh, up to four individuals to the national conference. Uh, and so you need to, when you work on your budgets for your proposals, make sure that you um, budget for up to four individuals to attend um, the orientation and or the conference. So that's just a quick overview of the type of uh, technical assistance and training uh, that we provide. We work very closely with PJA uh, throughout the process of uh, both technical assistance and the national conferences uh, to make sure that um, we are providing all of the grantees uh, with the most up-to-date information. So uh, at this point, I will turn it back over to our moderator for uh, any questions that you may have for Danica or me. Thank you. Great. So we have received a number of questions in the course of the webinar, um, but I would like to encourage you to keep sending those in through the Q&A box on the lower right-hand side of the screen. Um, so I'm just going to start off the then. Uh, so it says, so someone says, for expansion grants, it states that we need to put 5% of the budget aside for data collection. Can we budget that as a percentage of the salary of the person who will be responsible for collecting the data? Uh, that can certainly um, factor into the cost. So it's whatever um, uh, costs are required to collect that data. So um, that can certainly be part of that 5% of overall cost. Okay. Um, we have another question. So. People seem to be a little confused about how will it mission budget for the JMA to CP conference. Uh -huh. Are you budgeting this for two years of travel or just one year? Um, it's just it's one year. Mm -hmm. So even though the project is two years, um, you're only budgeting for one year. We actually only put on the national conference every other year, although we do a grantee orientation every year. So all new grantees, um, even if you've been a past grantee, um, if, you, if you are a 2013 recipient, you will need to attend um, one grantee orientation event. And then um, you will also budget for one, um, if you're a Category 2 or 3 applicant, um, your one national conference event as well. Um, so we have a lot of questions regarding what constitutes a mental health agency. 
Um, so we have someone who says, a mental health agency is responsible for mental health services or co-occurring mental health and substance abuse services. Are you defining services as treatment and clinical services, or is the definition broader? Um, I, I, I guess I would need more information as to what the question is uh, in terms of broader. Um, what else would uh, be considered um, services? But generally, yes, it's, it's treatment services um, and, and the like. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what, what specifically the question was getting at. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, yes, we're talking about, you know, treatment and related services. Great. Um, and we have additional questions from, uh, can a community-based organization that is contracted with a local mental health agency as a provider apply for this grant? Um, no, unfortunately, it, so there must be a criminal justice partner together with a mental health agency. Um, so, unfortunately, a community-based organization would not um, be a criminal justice partner, um, and unless they're a government entity, either state or local um, or tribal, would not be an eligible applicant either. Great. Um, we have some questions. We have some past grantees who are asking, are past grantees eligible to apply for planning and implementation or expansion grants? Or need um, both, absolutely. Um, we've funded in the past um, applicants who have received planning grants and gone on to receive planning and implementation grants, and then also in planning and implementation grantees who've gone on to receive expansion grants. So the answer is yes. Okay. Um, must all objectives and performance measures be included, even if they're not appropriate to a proposal? No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely not. That's just, it's a sampling, and actually I, sh I should also um, uh, state that, that the performance measures that are listed in the solicitation are not the complete comprehensive list of performance measures for each individual category. It's just a sampling of the key measures. So the applicant will want to be responsive to those measures that are um, relevant to their project or program. Can an agency apply for more than one category of funding? Um, yes, but you can't receive funding. Well, actually, let me let me let me think about that for a moment. Um, I'm going to hold on to it and we'll get back to that then. So let's go back to that one. Okay, great. Um, so we have, I, I work for a county mental health agency overseeing the county commissioners. Are we considered a local unit of government? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? So it says, I work for a county mental health agency that's overseen by county commissioners. Uh-huh. So yes. Yes. yes, that would that would count. Okay. So, so we have a person who asks, can we use planning funds to develop an approach for needs assessment and strategies to help this population? Um yeah, that would be a that would be an appropriate planning grant um, focus. Mm -hmm. And um, let's circle back um, to the other question about multiple applications. So I think this will help to clarify. Um, in past years, we've had state agencies apply on behalf of different projects and sites, um, such as perhaps the state um, AOC, um, um, Administrator of the Courts, um, apply on behalf of, say, a mental health court in one jurisdiction and maybe a pretrial diversion program in another jurisdiction, but it's the same state agency that's applying for both of those um, 
projects, and that's perfectly okay. So in, in that case, it would be one applicant submitting multiple applications, but for different projects. I should I should provide that clarification that it must be for different um, different projects. Um, we have a question from someone that asked, um, has this grant been used in the past to fund collaborations for crisis intervention team trainings and development between law enforcement and mental health? Absolutely, and that's uh, definitely an encouraged use of funds. Um, in the past, there's been a, um, a low application rate amongst law enforcement agencies, and that's something we would very strongly like to encourage is um, law enforcement agencies to apply, and specifically CIT is, is a wonderful um, program to, to implement. Um, so someone asked, does the application have to cover all of the goals, objectives, and deliverables, or can we pick off that list of goals, objectives, and deliverables at the end of solicitation? Um, obviously, it's, it's the goals, objectives, and deliverables that are um, relevant to your program. So, specifically, so I'm looking at the solicitation and on page five, goals, objectives, and deliverables. And what it does is it lists out what grant funds may be used to fund um, with several bullet points that I think I covered in the beginning of my um, presentation as well, talking about um, different uses, uh, how the grant funds may be used. But certainly, there's no need to try, and I don't know how it would possibly be either, to try and hit all of these different uses. So obviously, you just want to focus on um, on whichever is most appropriate to your program. We just try to be as um, inclusive as possible, listing as many uses as, as we could envision. So we are a very rural, um, by some definitions, thank you. We are a mental health authority and want to partner with more than one juvenile justice department to apply for a planning grant. Is it acceptable to have more than one justice partner? Um, it should be between one justice partner. Okay. So, and perhaps the solution might be that you partner with a state and that state oversees multiple jurisdictions. Um, that's a possible solution, but, but generally speaking, there, there can be other um, uh, supporting partners. Um, obviously that's allowed, but there should be only one primary relationship, one primary criminal justice agency and one primary mental health provider. Okay. Um, we also have a question about um, collaboration, which is, can a Department of Corrections collaboration be an internal collaboration between security and mental health services to the target population, or does it need to be an external partner? That's a great question and not one I've come across before. Um, Um, I think, generally speaking, within um, corrections, the, the mental health services treatment provider within the institution is not seen as a separate provider um, under this program, but um, what I'd like to do is actually do a little bit of research on that question and um, invite that person to follow up offline. Um, maybe if you, you can, um, Mariana, uh, provide yeah. me their contact information offline and I'll follow up with them. Great. Right. Um, and someone asked, just for clarification, the maximum amount allowed within each category of funding, is it for each year or is it for the total grant period? The total grant period. Thank you for asking that question. There's been some confusion over that in the past. So you'd, if you had a two-year grant, you'd want to divide that total amount by two years. Um, we also have a question from someone that asks, can, can these funds be subcontracted out? 
But yeah, yeah. absolutely. So um, that, that's definitely a possibility, depending on who the applicant is. If it's a state agency that perhaps has, you know, is just a, a neutral grant making agency and wants to um, uh, subcontract out services, that's that's fine. Just as long as the uh, that there is that partnership intact between a criminal justice and our juvenile justice. Um, uh, agency and the mental health provider. Okay. Um, let's see. So someone asked, if we don't provide services, but instead we facilitate wraparound services for youth, does that qualify as a mental health agency? Uh, n not under the definition um, listed in MIOGRA and in the solicitation. Um, I have another question from someone interested in CIT. So they asked, if the target population is, are, includes those accused of a crime, can resources be directed to individuals who may not yet be accused? Can, can resources be directed to individuals who are not yet accused? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, so when we're talking about eligibility, um, of, for the program, um, for those who are receiving services under the program. Um, we're talking about those who are in, that are criminal, criminally justice involved, so who, who, have, who are involved in the criminal justice system because of a specific offense that has taken place, whether or not um, it has been charged or there has been a conviction or it's been adjudicated yet or not. So we're looking at that specific um, incident, and we're looking at whether the, that charge um, meets the violent offender definition um, that's, that's listed in the statute, so whether it has those um, that, the specific elements of violence. So um, I understand that CIT programs generally, you know, are responding to um, – to situations, to crisis situations, obviously. Um, um, so they're not providing specific services as a result, if that makes sense. So, so CIT is more about training law enforcement um, to respond appropriately um, in mental health situations where, where it may be, um, there may be a, a mental health crisis. Um, it does not, there's not a direct correlation there between services provided and response to a crisis situation, if that makes sense. So regardless of the individuals involved, I just, I don't want there to be confusion that you may or may not be able to fund a crisis intervention team. I want to be very clear, you absolutely can fund um, CIT training um, and the like with these funds because you're not providing specific services to an individual, um, if that makes sense. I don't know that I'm explaining that well, but if I, again, if, if there's somebody I need to follow up with offline, I'd be happy to do that. Great. Um, so I have some, many people asking this, which is that they understand that there's a minimum amount that must be spent on data collection, and they want to know if there's a maximum amount. There are a number of people who want to use funding to evaluate their program to some extent. No, so, there's not a maximum amount. Um, uh, yeah, what, what the, it, as far as the maximum amount, it's the maximum allowable um, program dollar amount. Um, but other than that, the especially for expansion grantees who are looking to enhance their programs and want to enhance their data collection um, capabilities and and really make that the mainstay of their their focus, they're mm -hmm. welcome to do that um, and and um, you know put in for as much as necessary within the allowable limits. Okay. Um, we have some questions from past applicants, if they have applied in the past and they haven't received funding, is it possible to get feedback on the application before reapplying? Um, past grantees, um, I'm sorry, past applicants um, who, are, who are not grantees um, should have received 
their um, peer review comments on their application at the time of their application. So that would have come after they had received notification that they were not recipients. Okay. Do you have um, any limitations on the types of treatment that can be provided to the mental health agencies? Some individuals are asking about alternative treatments such as teletherapy uh, and telepsych and substance abuse treatment. So I want to refer, I'm just flipping through here, okay. So on page six of the solicitation, um, we specifically state that applicants are strongly encouraged um, to use evidence-based practices in providing mental health treatment services. And specifically, we, uh, we, we list several examples of this, but then we also provide um, um, a link here to um, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's Guide to Evidence-Based Practices and their website. Um, which is www.stamsa.gov backslash EBP web guide. Um, and that should really be um, a guide to um, applicants who are looking um, to what sorts of treatment um, services we um, support. This is, this is our priority, what's listed here on page six, and those that are on Stamsa's website. Um, so, is it considered the plan thing if client funds are used to pay for additional staff hours? For I'm sorry, I, I missed the last part of if what you just said. If grant funds are used to pay for additional staff hours, so I would assume overtime? Um, generally speaking, um, that's not anticipated in, in the beginning of a grant. Um, so, Overtime shouldn't be built into an award. Um, there should be, you should build in the appropriate staff time, the appropriate number of staff um, to meet, meet the program goals and not at all plan on overtime. Okay. So uh, we have a question for Jerry, if she's still around. Um, you mentioned earlier a website where we can view current grantee projects. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Um, if you were to go to uh, our website, um, again, you'll find a number of, of resources that uh, our current grantees use. Uh, we also have some uh, descriptions on the website of, of some of the programs that current grantees um, are implementing or have developed, uh, and you know, they might be helpful for you as you think about what type of program you want to put together. I, I, I guess my best advice would be to visit the website um, and take a look yourself to see the resources that are on there. Okay. Perfect. Um, let's see, we have a lot of questions to for those here. Um, so, would you... What do you think of, um, seven, so a lot of people are asking about CIT, CIT being applied to corrections and probation. Uh -huh. um, what do you, for those practices that are not evidence-based, but instead are being applied to a different domain, how does huh? CJ review those practices? I'm sorry, so what was the question? Is that that? Is that acceptable? So something that's like CIT, which was, is originally made for law enforcement, if it's being transferred to probation, are you guys still? Is that yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so just so someone wants to clarify here, a community-based nonprofit that provides mental health treatment services cannot be the lead agency, but it can receive funds as a subcontractor. Correct. So they can't be the one to apply um, as a non-government entity, but yes, they can be, um, as a mental health uh, service provider, they can certainly be um, a partner in the collaboration. Okay. 
If they're running a true diversion program that allows law enforcement to take someone to shelter and treatment instead of charging them, is that okay? That's that, that, yes. Okay. Um, can all of the match funding be from in time, or is there also a cash requirement? Um, there's not a requirement, it can be either, or some combination. Um, we also have a question, can an agency apply directly for phase two planning and implementation and skip phase one? Oh, absolutely, yes. Depending on where the, um, the partnership is, it, uh, they can also go right to expansion, depending on, on um, the stage in which the collaboration um, currently exists. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question from someone that asks, if we work with both mental health treatment and substance abuse treatment, uh -huh. will we need to pick two different evidence-based programs, or can we pick one that encompasses both? Um, absolutely. So funds can be used towards um, substance abuse treatment as well for those who have co-occurring disorders. So, yes, that's very appropriate to choose um, evidence-based um, treatment that encompasses both. Absolutely. So I think we have a number of people who are a bit confused about the grant categories. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure the sound may have given it out at that point. Uh, so if we could just do a little sure. quick run through to categories one, two, and three. Okay. Sure. So I think there's a lot of people. Sure. So I'm just going to flip that here in this solicitation and go through that in a little more detail. So I am on page eight for those of you who want to follow along. Um, and so the, the planning category, so again, that is the um, category one for up to $50,000 for a project period of 12 months. So category one applicants are just looking to, um, to begin where there may not have been um, any collaboration in place yet. Um, say I'm going to give an example of a jurisdiction that wants to start a mental health court for example, um, you know, and they're just starting to think about it, and they're looking at who the players need to be, um, they need to, de to design a, a strategic collaborative plan, um, and this is just an example, it's just one possible use, I'm just trying to give it a little bit of um, context for those who are trying to differentiate the differences, um, and, and obviously, and so all of the steps in planning and looking at um, what, how, you know, what will be provided, how it will be provided, um, this, that's what this kind of grant is, is for, it's for the planning process, for those who are just beginning um, a specific collaboration. And it's obviously, like I said, not limited to a mental health court, that's just an example. Um, it can be any kind of collaboration where it does not currently exist um, but applicants are, are considering some new um, intervention, some new program, um, or a target population um, that wants to be addressed. And really the key to planning is about, de is really developing that effective collaboration representing support from all levels of government, uh, justice, mental health, and substance abuse treatment services, as well as transportation, housing, advocates, consumers, victims, and family member members. So it's about bringing all of those stakeholders together um, and beginning to really um, nail down what the collaboration will look like. And, and these grantees will re receive really intensive technical assistance from BJA um, to support those sorts of efforts at that early stage. So category two, the planning and implementation stage, um, this is, again, up to 250000 for a period of 24 months. Um, this is for those who may ha already have those partnerships in place um, and who have already started that, that initial dialogue and, and nailing down what it is that they want to do, what their program may look like, um, but who um, um, are, may not be quite ready to implement or who are ready to implement um, and have already completed the planning process. And 
so what that, it, it, it involves the grantee working with our training and technical assistance provider to design a planning and implementation guide for their program um, before they begin activities on the actual implementation process. Um, um, and then once that's approved, um, they will begin the actual implementation, so actually starting their program. Um, and then obviously, um, um, and I should point out too on page nine, there's there's some bullets there that talk about some of some other ex examples. Um, so that's where you know we talked about CIT. This is the this is listed here as the first bullet. Training programs to offer law enforcement personnel specialized and comprehensive training and procedures to identify and respond appropriately to incidents. Um, that's exactly what we're talking about here, and that's an encouraged use of funds. So then moving into category three, the expansion. Um, that's the $200,000 limit for 24 months, um, and that's where you already have some kind of collaboration in place. Maybe you're a task grant team, maybe you're not. Um, maybe you, know, you, you already have though, these partnerships, and you're already doing this work. Um, but you want to take it to the next level. So that's where we were talking about, you know, maybe um, you want to ramp up your training efforts and institute some new training program. Maybe you want to en enhance your data um, collection capabilities and use that data to enhance your program and make sure you're targeting the right individuals with the right interventions. Um, you know, it's about, it's about really taking your program to the next level and, and enhancing or adding something new or some new component, um, but really, you know, maximizing um, um, your program um, to, the, to the best of, of, of your capabilities. So hopefully that provides a little bit more detail. Again, I would encourage applicants who have not already done so to read really closely what's in the solicitation because um, on pages 8 and 9 um, and a little bit on 10, we provide some really detailed examples um, of what what possible uses of these funds in these different categories can look like. Um, and I think that folks' questions might be naturally answered by, um, by reading through this carefully. Right. Thank you so much, Danica. Uh -huh. um, I think we have time for maybe one more question, and then I'm going to ask direct people to email me with questions. Um, the last question I have is about the number of awards. Do you have yeah. any idea... Is there a oh, so, so that's what I was saying Congress? earlier that, um, you know, we Congress has not issued a budget for fiscal year 2013. Um, and for any of you who may have been following the news, actually we're, um, we're facing, you know, sequestration if, um, if other fiscal decisions are not made. So um, we don't know. We don't know if we'll be on a – right now we're on a continuing resolution, which means that we're at the same – um, funding levels at, at 2012 um, until they institute um, a budget. So we don't know. We anticipate that there will be funding, obviously, um, but we just don't know how much. Um, and this this year in Congress, it's, cut, it's anybody's guess um, as to what um, sorts of cuts um, you know we may be facing. So unfortunately, we have no idea um, uh, what our numbers will look like. But um, but encourage folks to, um, you know, follow uh, follow the news. Right. Um, all right. Uh, so I think we should end on that note. It's already 3 o'clock. Um, I would like to let everyone know that if you don't have your answer question during the webinar or maybe you missed it, I would like to remind you that we did record the webinar and um, you should be able to watch a recording of it in the next few days. Um, I've also distributed the link to the PowerPoint through the chat window. Um, so, and if you have any questions that you think we're not answered, I would like to encourage you to email info at consensusproject.org. I'm going to pull of the questions that Danica said she would follow up on, but if you have anything else specifically, please email me, and I will do my best to get it to her in a prompt fashion. Um, so yeah, I would like to thank you all for your attendance and participation, and thank you to the Bureau of Justice Assistance for sponsoring this event, and a big thank you to our presenters, Danica Binkley and Jerry Murphy, and I'd like everyone to have a great afternoon. Thank you.